When the Jewish religious leaders saw Jesus die on the cross, I'm sure there was a great sense of relief in their hearts, in their minds. They had despised him. They had plotted his death, and now it was, it was done. And no doubt they must have thought, well, that's over. We're finally through with that troublemaker. But how wrong they were. You see, they only thought they had heard the last from him and the last about him. They thought when he cried out on the cross, it's finished, that was all they were going to hear from him and about him. But that wasn't the case because they would soon hear words being spoken about Jesus all over Israel by his followers, by his disciples. And the primary thing that they would hear from Christ's followers concerning him was that he had risen from the dead. And folks, that was the last thing they expected to hear because they all saw him die and they all thought that was it. That was the end of him. But it may surprise you to know that the Lord's own disciples were not expecting him to rise from the dead either because they were not expecting him to die. They didn't think he was going to die, even though on several occasions, Jesus had very plainly told his followers that he was going to die. And then three days later, he would be raised from the grave they failed to understand what he was saying. They didn't know what he was talking about. For example, here's what we read in Mark chapter 9, verses 31 and 32. <coughs> For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they'll kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand the statement, and they were afraid to ask him. And it's obvious that they, they didn't understand because when he did die, they were crushed. They were overwhelmed with grief, not only because of losing Christ, but also because with his death, all of their hopes, all of their dreams for a messianic kingdom with Jesus as their king, it died as well. It was over from their perspective. And you can just see how sad and how disheartened they, they were by all of this going on, and you can see it by the reaction of two of our Lord's disciples who were traveling on the road to Emmaus, and what they said to Jesus soon after his death, not realizing that it was Jesus they were speaking to. Notice, notice how sad and disappointed they are as they tell Jesus the events, what, what's taken place recently. Luke chapter 24, breaking in at verse 13. <coughs> And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself appeared and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood, notice this, they stood still, they stopped looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty indeed in word in the sight of God and of all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers, how they delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all of this, it's the third day since these things happened. Now, I don't think 2,000 years removed from, from this event, I, I don't think we can fully appreciate the despair, the utter despair that our Lord's disciples felt at this time. Remember, for three years they had followed this man and put all of their hopes, all of their dreams, all of their aspirations in him. He was their Lord, he was their Messiah, he was their king, he was their rabbi, he was their friend, he was their mentor. They heard his teaching, they witnessed his many miracles, they observed his faultless and sinless and blameless life. And now it was just over. It was just over. No wonder the New Testament paints a picture of utter hopelessness on the part of Christ's disciples in their reactions to his death. This is why we see, for example, Mary Magdalene weeping, uncontrollably weeping in the garden tomb area because she thought that Christ's dead body had been removed from the tomb and she didn't know where it was. 
This is why we see Thomas so hurt, so disappointed, that even when the other disciples say, hey, Thomas, we've seen the Lord, he refuses to believe them, thus gaining forever the negative nickname, Doubting Thomas. And this is why we see the apostles huddled together behind closed doors in the upper room in the city of Jerusalem, hiding from the Jewish authorities out of fear for their own lives. So without doubt, this was the saddest, bleakest moment in their lives. These people were in anguish and in deep emotional pain. Not only because they were in mourning over Jesus and and the kingdom they thought he was about to usher in, but also because they were completely uncertain as to what to do now. What do we do next? We We didn't anticipate this. We're not prepared for this. After three years of following him, fully expecting that he would establish his kingdom on earth, they were not prepared for his death. And so this was a time of incredible gloom, despair, misery for all of them. This was indeed the death of a vision. But God in his mercy didn't allow them to stay in that emotional pit very long because soon they would know that Jesus was alive and that he had risen from the dead. And in in a few weeks, they would receive the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, who would not only empower them to be bold witnesses for Christ, but who would also enlighten them to be, as to the significance, the theological significance, the meaning of Christ's death, substitutionary death, and the resurrection. However, before any of this could happen, they first needed to be convinced, persuaded in their own thinking that Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, as I mentioned a few moments ago, although Jesus had talked several times to them about his upcoming death and resurrection, they hadn't understood it, they hadn't received it, they didn't know what he was really talking about. In fact, it was during one of the times that the Lord was telling them that he was going to experience this suffering, this pain, this death, and then the resurrection, that Peter actually had the audacity the, the goal to rebuke the Lord for saying such things about being rejected, about being killed, about rising from the dead. And so in spite of telling them, making it very clear that he was going to rise from the dead, they were not anticipating this. Like most Jewish people of that era, they believed in a general future resurrection, but not the specific imminent one that Jesus was speaking about. But when they finally did come to believe in his resurrection, and they did, they were convinced of it. They were absolutely convinced of it. It revolutionized these lives. These men and women, these followers of his, were never the same. Instead of being fearful like they had been, they became bold. They became courageous. They, they were willing to, to even risk their lives as they witnessed for Christ. <coughs> Instead of being in despair like they had been, they were filled with incredible hope, refused to be discouraged. Even when facing the possibility of death, they forged on. And far from feeling alone and abandoned by God like they had felt, Christ's disciples experienced just a a new reality of his ongoing presence in their lives. And that gave them great strength to face any circumstance without anxiety. And folks, that's why Easter Sunday is is such a significant day of the year, because it not only is a reminder to us that Jesus rose from the dead, but it also presents us with the opportunity to do some serious thinking about the resurrection and the implications of the resurrection in our lives. For those of us who already believe it, it it forces us to to focus on this. It forces us to, to think through what this means in our lives, that Christ is alive. It's reassuring. It's comforting. It it reminds us that we have hope because someday we are going to face death. And if Jesus Christ rose from the dead and if he conquered death, then by his mercy, we will too. Also, for those who are skeptical about Christ's resurrection, we realize that on a Sunday Easter, There are many who come to church to be polite and and courteous with family members. And so I recognize some of you may not not really believe in the resurrection of Christ. Or you may think, well, maybe it happened, but you're a little skeptical about it. Well, it allows you to hear about the solid evidence 
that Christ really was raised from the dead so that like his first followers, you can become convinced of this event and it will change your life forever. You see, when you truly believe that Jesus is alive right now, that this wasn't simply an event that happened 2,000 years ago, but it was an event that also has reality for today, then it changes the way you think. It changes your priorities, your ambitions. It, it changes the way you talk, the way you react to circumstances, the way you, you talk to people, the way you relate to God, the way you relate to others, and it changes the way you face your own mortality and death. But before any of these changes can occur, you first have to be persuaded in your mind that Jesus did rise from the dead and that Jesus Christ is alive right now. And that brings us to our study this morning in John chapter 20, the passage I read earlier to you. <coughs> now, it's helpful to know that there are four gospel accounts of the life of Christ in the New Testament. Why four? Why not just one? Well, each gospel writer emphasizes something unique about Jesus. So, for example, Matthew's emphasis is clearly on Jesus being Israel's true king, their true Messiah. Mark's emphasis is on Christ as the Lord's servant who came to give his life for many. Luke stresses the humanity of Christ, the manhood of Christ. <coughs> well, John, in his gospel account, note this, John lays special emphasis on the deity of Christ, that Christ is God. And we can see it very clearly that the gospel of John is written with one specific primary purpose in mind. Because here's what we read at the end of John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. <coughs> but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John says there are many more miracles that Jesus did that he did not include his, in his gospel narrative. And all of these miracles pointed to the same thing. They all pointed to the deity of Christ. But John tells us that he has chosen, and we know it was by the Holy Spirit, he has chosen to write about a few of these signs, not all of them, just a few of them, And he's done this for the purpose of helping us to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, which is to say that he's God the Son, so that we'll trust him for our salvation. Therefore, John's objective, John's goal, John's primary purpose in writing his gospel account <clears throat> is to convince us, us his readers, of the deity of Christ so that we will trust him to be our Savior, our Lord, and as a result, have eternal life. Now, this emphasis on, on Christ's deity, it's apparent from the very start of the Gospel of John. <coughs> John starts out by telling us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he says, and the Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. Dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And then... 20 chapters later, John essentially closes his book on the same note about Christ's deity by recording Doubting Thomas's incredible declaration, which sums up the whole gospel of John. When Thomas looked at Jesus and he said, my Lord and my God. And in between these two loud and very clear pronouncements of Christ's deity, John records a number of Christ's statements that declare that he is the eternal God, such as John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. I'm the eternal God. I am the great I am. And in John chapter 10, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. And as I've already said, John records for us scores of miracles all pointing to the fact that Jesus is Lord over nature and creation. And folks, the greatest of these miracles that he records is Christ's resurrection from the dead. Now, it's a fact that no human being actually saw Jesus rise from the dead. No one was there. No one observed it. <coughs> so, each of his disciples then 
they had to discover for themselves that Christ had conquered death and that he was alive. And that's exactly what John chapter 20 is about. You see, in John chapter 20, the apostle John devotes the entire chapter to telling us how Jesus convinced several of his followers that he had risen from the dead, namely Mary Magdalene and the other women who came with her to the tomb, the apostles, and then Thomas the doubter. But interestingly, before John, the Apostle John tells us about how these individuals came to believe in Christ and in his resurrection. He tells us how he, John, how he personally came to be, not only believe in it, how he came to be convinced of it. Without identifying himself by name, John never refers to himself by name in his gospel account out of modesty, he never calls, him, calls attention to himself. But John does take the first 10 verses of this chapter to tell us how he, how he came personally to be persuaded that Jesus had risen from the dead and was alive. And his reason for doing this, as I've said, it's in line with the main purpose of the book, which is to convince us that Christ is God. In other words, John wants you and I to believe. He wants us to believe. He's giving the evidence before us. He wants us to look at this evidence. He wants us to think and be convinced that Jesus rose from the dead. And so on this Easter morning, we're going to work our way through the first 10 verses of John chapter, 12, of John chapter 20, rather, in order to discover how the apostle John himself, how he came to be convinced of this, and hopefully you'll be convinced as well. Normally, I have an outline when I preach, but I don't have an outline for these verses. We're just going to follow John's train of thought as he tells us verse by verse how he came to be convinced that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The chain of events that brought him to this belief, it begins in verse 1 of chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Now the story opens, but not with John but rather with Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was a woman who, according to Luke chapter 8, verse 2, had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus, and she subsequently became a devoted follower of his. Now, putting all the four gospel accounts together, we get a, a clear picture of what's going on, a composite picture. The time is early Sunday morning, and a number of women, including Mary Magdalene, they've come to the tomb of, of Jesus, hoping to anoint his corpse for a proper Jewish burial. And the reason they waited until Sunday morning to do this is because no work was ever done on Saturday. That's the Sabbath, and that was the Jewish day of rest. So early Sunday morning, while it's still dark, these women arrive at the tomb, only to find that the heavy stone that had been placed at the grave's entrance was now rolled away. Drawing upon all the accounts of the story given in the New Testament, here's the way one Bible scholar explained what happened when these women arrived at the tomb and what they did in light of finding the stone rolled away. He writes, these women started out while it was yet dark and arrived at the tomb in the early dawn when it was difficult to distinguish objects. On reaching the tomb, the women were astonished to find the stone removed from the entrance. We must imagine them standing about, afraid to to go too close and wondering what had happened. Who moved the stone? Had the, the tomb been pilfered? Had the body of Jesus been stolen? Had Joseph of Arimathea removed it to another place? What were they to do? At last, they decided that the disciples must be told that Mary Magdalene was dispatched to find them. After a while, it began to grow lighter and the women grew bolder. They decided to look into the tomb there they saw the angels. The women were afraid, but an angel said, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here, for he's risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples. Now, in the meantime, while these women, in obedience to the angel's command to look for the Lord's disciples, tell them what he had told them, that Jesus was alive. In the meantime, Mary Magdalene, who had been dispatched earlier, had found two disciples. She found Peter, and she found John. And John picks up the story from this point in verse 2. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, 
and said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. Now, not knowing what the angel had said to the other women because she wasn't there, she had left prior to that announcement, we read that upon finding Peter and John, he, John is that other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She tells them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've placed his body. Now, she's making an assumption at this point. She really doesn't know. But she's making an assumption. And what she probably means by this is that the Lord's enemies, not being content with murdering him, have only added to his indignity by entering the tomb, stealing his body, and putting it in some unknown place. Now, as I said, she's, she's only guessing at this point. She doesn't really know what's going on. But upon hearing that the Lord's body is missing, John tells us that he and Peter immediately start out towards the tomb, perhaps walking fast at first, and they break into a, a jog, a run, verses 3 and 4. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Now, I'm always interested in verses in the Bible that speak about running. This verse does. It's interesting to note that while Peter and John started out running together, eventually John ran ahead of Peter because he was faster, most likely because he was younger. He had youth on his side. It only makes sense. But regardless of why he was faster, John arrived at the tomb. And it's here folks, where the story becomes fascinating because John tells us what happened when he reached the tomb. Verse 5. And stooping in and looking, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. So upon arriving at the tomb, John tells us that at first he was hesitant. He was hesitant to enter. So he just looked in from the entrance and he saw the grave clothes that Christ's body had been wrapped in. He saw them just lying there. Now, I want to explain something that's extremely important. There are two Greek words that John uses in this verse that throw a great deal of light on the situation. The first word is the word saw, as in he saw the linen wrappings lying there. This word saw is the most common Greek word for seeing something. It just means to take a, a quick look, what we would call a casual glance, and nothing more than that, just a quick casual glance. The second important Greek word in this verse is the word used to describe the position of the grave clothes, the word lying. And the significance of this word is that it means to carefully place something in orderly, in an orderly fashion. In other words, not in a haphazard, chaotic way. In ancient Greek literature, literature outside of the Bible, it was this particular word that was used to speak of legal documents lying in their proper order, as well as clothes that were lying properly in their place. Now, what I want you to know and understand is that what John is telling us is that what he saw when he bent down and looked into the tomb were the grave clothes that Jesus had been wrapped in, and they were just lying there undisturbed and untouched. That's important. And the significance of this is just absolutely monumental. And if you don't see it yet, don't feel bad because at this point, John didn't even understand the importance of the undisturbed grave clothes. But he will very soon, just as you will. But in the meantime, we read that Peter, the slower runner, he arrives, and John tells us what Peter does upon reaching the tomb, verses 6 and 7. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head not lying with the linen wrappings but rolled up in a place by itself. Now John tells us that unlike himself, Peter, Peter didn't hesitate to enter the tomb. True to his impetuous nature, Peter just goes straight into the tomb and he also sees the same linen wrappings lying there undisturbed that John saw. But, but, he sees something else, something that John missed, something John did not notice. 
Peter sees that the cloth that had been wrapped around Christ's head wasn't with the other grave clothes, but rather it's rolled up in a place all by itself. Now, this oddity really struck Peter. And I say that because the particular Greek word that John used in this verse to describe that Peter saw the linen wrappings lying there, it's a different word than the one he used to speak of his quick glance into the tomb. You see, this particular Greek word means to, note this, carefully scrutinize. It means to closely contemplate something, the situation. In other words, contrary to John simply taking a glancing look and noticing the grave clothes lying undisturbed and thinking nothing of it, Peter, on the other hand, Peter gave an investigative look, an analytical look, carefully looking over the situation and trying to figure this one out. Apparently, though, even with this long analytical look, Peter, Peter doesn't know what to make of this. <coughs> He's puzzled. He's perplexed. He can't understand this. Why were Christ's grave clothes undisturbed and his headband rolled up in a place by itself? It just doesn't make sense to Peter, but it will soon, as it will with many of you here today. You see, we often hear Christians say something like, well, Christ's tomb was empty. It was empty, and, but technically it wasn't empty. It wasn't empty because while Jesus wasn't there, his grave clothes were. They were there, but thank God the tomb wasn't completely empty because God planned it that way. You see, he wanted these two men, Peter and John, to be puzzled at first. He wanted that so that it would force them to to think this thing through in order to figure out the significance of the grave clothes just lying there undisturbed. Now, to help us understand what's going on, I want to take you back to John chapter 19, to the burial given to Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. It was take, this took place just a few days earlier. See, according to the law of Moses, the body of a person hanging on a tree, and that's what the cross is, it's, it's part of a tree, two wooden beams from a tree. According to the Mosaic law, a person who hung on a tree needed to be taken down and buried by sundown. Now, if it were up to the Romans, they didn't care. They would have just let the bodies of their crucified victims hang on the crosses for the vultures to eat. But the Romans tended to respect the religious practices of the people they ruled over. So they let the Jewish people take down the bodies and bury them in common graves reserved for criminals. (coughs) However, in the case of Jesus, God intervened by raising up a wealthy man by the name of Joseph from the town of Arimathea, who owned a private unused tomb, a tomb that Peter and John could investigate draw their own conclusions from. Now, the way that Jewish people in the first century, the way they buried their dead was by wrapping the body in linen bands with pounds and pounds of dry spices inserted into the the folds of the linen. The body would then be placed face up without a coffin and laid in a tomb that had been cut into the rocks in either the hills of Judea or the hills of Galilee. (coughs) And here's what we read in John 19 concerning how Christ's body was prepared for burial and then placed in the tomb. John 19, starting in verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body, and Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it with linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, according to what we read here, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, he supplied the tomb and Nicodemus supplied the spices uh, 
of myrrh and aloes, which were mixed together, and they weighed, we're told, about 100 pounds. They would have first washed the body of Jesus, then wrapped his body in linen bands while sprinkling the spices into the folds of the linen. Now, in keeping with the way ancient Jewish people did things, Joseph and Nicodemus would have wrapped the entire body of Jesus except, except the face, the neck, and the upper part of the shoulders. His head would have been covered, though by a cloth that had been twirled about like a turban. Now, why is this so important to know? Listen closely. No one, as I said earlier, no one actually saw Jesus rising from the dead. No human being saw Jesus rising from the dead. No one witnessed the actual moment when he arose. But if we had been there on that original Easter Sunday, what would we have seen? Would we have seen Jesus stir, open his eyes, sit up, and take the linen cloth off of himself? Absolutely not. Not at all. That would have been a resuscitation. That would have been a reviving. That would have been a recovery from an apparent but not real death. No, if we had been in the tomb when Jesus arose, we would have seen something completely different. We would have seen that Christ's body had been changed into a resurrection body that just, note this, that just passed through the grave clothes and out of the sealed tomb just as it later passed through closed solid doors. That's exactly how it happened. And when that took place, what do you think happened to those grave clothes that had been around our Lord's body? They just collapsed. They just settled down because there's no longer a body to fill them out and give them any form. So they just sunk down along with the 100 pounds of spices that were in them. In other words, the linen that had been around Christ's body would be lying undisturbed in the exact place he was positioned. And the cloth that had been around his head would be in its own place too, separated by a little space where his face, neck, and shoulders had previously been. Now do you see what was so puzzling to Peter when he went in the tomb and he looked around? Mary Magdalene had said that the body of Jesus had been removed. But that didn't make any sense to Peter. He must have stood in that tomb for a while just trying to figure this thing out. You see, if grave robbers had taken the body, they certainly would have taken the linen cloths too. They wouldn't carry around the naked body, nor would robbers take the time to unwrap the linens. But, but if in the remote possibility that they did unwrap the linens, they would have had to rip those grave cloths off in in a disorderly manner. But the clothes were lying undisturbed, and the head bandage was wrapped together just like a head had been there, but was now gone. And this is why Peter can't figure it out. But while he's still in the tomb pondering the situation, John tells us that he arrived. He, well, he had arrived, but he decides at this point to enter the tomb to see what was going on and why, why Peter's been there so long. Verse 8. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw, and what? He believed. He believed. John tells us that after going inside the tomb and seeing exactly what Peter saw, the undisturbed grave clothes and the head cloth lying in its own place, separated by a little space, he believed. You see, when John saw this scene, it all clicked. The light came on. It came together in his mind. He understood the meaning of the the undisturbed grave clothes and the head cloth. In fact, again, the Greek word that he uses in this verse for to see or saw, it's different from the other two words previously used. This particular word means to see with understanding. In other words, John not only saw the grave clothes, but he also understood their significance. The undisturbed grave clothes meant that Christ's body hadn't been stolen, it had been resurrected. His body wasn't moved, It just passed through the clothes. 
And, in, and, and just as I said, the light came on in John's mind and the Bible says he believed. So what did he believe? He believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. He believed that Jesus was everything he said he was, Lord, Messiah, the Son of God. He believed it all. And he believed all of this based, note this, solely on the evidence that he saw. You see, at this point in his life, neither he nor Peter believed in Christ's resurrection because they were aware that the Old Testament predicted this. Now, the Old Testament did predict this, but they were not aware at this point. They, they, it was the evidence, not the scriptures that convinced them. This is what John tells us <clears throat> in verse 9. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. Now, eventually, both John and Peter and all the apostles and all the disciples would come to understand that there were many Old Testament passages that spoke of Messiah rising from the dead. Perhaps the, the one that, that is so very, very clear is Psalm 16, verse 10, which is quoted in the New Testament. But we read this, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, David said, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Meaning the body of Christ would not decay. There would be a resurrection. Isaiah 53 also, verses 10 and 11 speak of this. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And then verse 11 goes on to expand on this. He'll prolong his days, meaning he'll, he'll rise from the dead. He'll die, but he'll rise from the dead. At this point in their lives, though, neither of these men, Peter or, or John, uh, understood that the scriptures clearly predicted this, but John still believed that Christ had risen from the dead, not because he saw it in the Old Testament, but because he saw the clear, strong, irrefutable evidence for Christ's resurrection. You see, the tomb was opened by the angels not to let Jesus out, but to let John and Peter look in and step in so that they would see the evidence of Christ's resurrection and believe it. You know what? You, 2,000 years later, you, you, you have all the evidence you need to believe in Christ as well. <coughs> and the only way you'll do that is if you have a, an open heart, a heart to believe the truth. But the evidence is there. Years ago, noted British attorney, Sir Edward Clark, said this about the evidence for Christ's resurrection. It is irrefutable, irrefutable. He said this, as a lawyer, I've made a prolonged study of the evidences for the events of the first Easter day. To me, the evidence is conclusive. And over and over again in the high court, I have secured the verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. <coughs> Inference follows on evidence, and a truthful witness is always artless and disdains effects. The gospel evidence for the resurrection is of this class, and as a lawyer, I accept it unreservedly as the testimony of truthful men to the facts they were able to substantiate. So what did John do once he came to believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead? Well, verse 10 says, so the disciples went away again to their own homes. We read that he and, and Peter, they just left the tomb and went to their respective homes. But John left as a believing man. He was now convinced that Christ had risen from the dead. And for John, the time of mourning was over. The fire of his dreams were now rekindled. His hopes were now alive and they were vibrant. John was convinced that Jesus Christ was not only alive, but that he was God. For only God per could perform a miracle like this to be raised from the dead. Only God can conquer death. That's exactly why John included this incident in his gospel account. As he said earlier, in order to convince you, in order to convince me, his readers, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God so that we will believe in him for eternal life. Listen, the question is, have you ever trusted Christ to be your savior, your Lord? Have you ever believed on him for eternal life? Someday we're all gonna die. You need to have an answer. 
as to how are your sins going to be forgiven before a holy God. It is only through Christ. Christ died on the cross for sinners. He paid the price. He was cursed in the place of us who deserve the curse of God, the condemnation of God. But he rose again to prove who he is, that he is God, and that if you would simply repent of your sin, which means turn from your, your self-focus, your self-centeredness, your self-absorption, and turn to Christ and trust him as your Lord and Savior, he will not only forgive your sins, he will give you his own righteousness on your account before God. That's the gospel. That's the hope that we have. But you have to be convinced in your mind that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The evidence is compelling. The evidence is compelling. If you choose not to believe it, it won't be because there isn't enough evidence to convince you. It's because you don't want to surrender your life to Christ as Lord. You're comfortable in your sin. You don't want to repent. You like the security but the Bible tells you that you must repent. You must be born again. You must trust Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So I urge you, surrender to him while you can. Put your confidence in him as your Savior. That's the only way to be forgiven of sins. That's the only way to go to heaven when you, you die. Jesus said, I am the way, the life, and the truth. No one comes to the Father but through me. Nobody, nobody but through him. So trust him today. What better day to trust Christ for salvation than Easter Sunday? And if you would like to speak to one of our pastors about this, about your relationship with Christ, then I invite you as we close the service to come up and just talk to me and I'll, I'll arrange for you to speak to someone. Now, if you're already a believer in Christ, then let the truth of his resurrection affect the way you think, the way, the way you live. This isn't simply an event that happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ is a living presence in our lives. So let, let him, and knowing that he's alive, let, let him make a difference in your marriage, your parenting, your work, your ethics, your morality, your conversations, your priorities. Our Lord is alive. Live like he is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this magnificent passage of scripture. Thank you for inspiring the, the Apostle John to write it. Lord, the evidence is compelling. And any thinking person would come away saying, it has to be true. There are no flaws to this. It has to be true. He did rise from the dead. I pray for any here who have never turned to you for salvation or perhaps people watching by live stream. I pray that today might be the day of their salvation, that you, you'll move in their hearts, convicting them of their sin, convicting them of their need for Christ, convicting them and persuading them that life is, is fleeting and someday they will die and they need to be prepared for death. And the only way to prepare for death is to know the one who conquered death. But Lord, we pray to that end. We pray also for those of us who know you. May this Easter Sunday be more than just getting together with family and friends and thinking about the events of Easter. But Lord, may the truth of your resurrection grip our hearts. May we live in the light of your presence May we live in, in the light of the fact that you are over all, all of us. You are Lord, you are present, and that we will give an account to you the way we, we lived. So Lord, we pray that you'll help us to keep our focus, our thoughts upon you today. We thank you that you're alive. We thank you that you conquered death, and we look forward to our own resurrection because you live, we know we'll live too. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.